Welcome participants to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour. As you roll in, please use the chat function to share where you're calling in from today. This is week seven, Scandinavia and China. Uh, welcome to all. It is 8 a.m. on the East Coast in the U.S., I believe 9 p.m. In, in Beijing, and somewhere in the middle <laughs> in, in, in Europe, in Stockholm. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Jaya, from Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> All right. Folks are still rolling in. Please feel free to use the chat function. Thank you, Chen Wen, uh, to let us know where you're calling in from today. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour, week seven. We'll get started in just one more minute. Hello from Minsk. Welcome, Julia. All right, I think it's time. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour. My name is Brian Brannon and I serve on the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators North America Branch Board of Directors and its Young Members Group Steering Committee. On behalf of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group Steering Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the ADR World Tour, Arbitration and Mediation as a Global Force for Good. The ADR World Tour celebrates the unique importance and efficiencies ADR provides in allowing the world's economy to remain operative and functional, even during times of great economic uncertainty. Perhaps no greater time of economic uncertainty has ever existed than today. The ADR World Tour focuses on 11 different regions throughout the world. We are on week seven in China and Scandinavia. The ADR World Tour specifically focuses on ADR and access to justice, ADR as an efficient alternative to traditional litigation, and ADR as a means to strengthen the rule of law. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour is power powdered by 18 volunteer contributors who serve on the central organizing group. Today, it is my pleasure to be joined by David Chung, who is based in New York, New York, and Kirsten Teo, who is based in Washington, D.C., USA. Welcome to all. Enjoy the China and Scandinavia Week 7 portion of the ADR World Tour. And over to you, Kirsten and David. Thank you very much, Brian. Welcome, everyone. The webinar theme today is Arbitrating for Peace. As the late Mr. Kofi Annan shared, the peaceful resolution of disputes rarely makes the headlines. The use of the rule of law in pursuit of peace often takes place quietly. The heroes involved, the men and women who make substantial contributions and advance peace in their capacities as brave political leaders, engaged legal specialists, and wise adjudicators of integrity receive little praise in international media. Today, we want to change that. For the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators China and Scandinavia Week, we want to shine the spotlight on some of these unsung heroes who worked behind the scenes towards advancing peace by our arbitrating disputes so that we can prevent wars and facilitate greater international trade and economic development. In that regard, today we highlight the Quiet Triumph arbitration documentary created by the FCC that was produced by Ms. Annette Magnusson. Ms. Annette Magnusson is the Secretary General of the Arbitration Institute of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. SCC since the year 2010, excuse me. Ms. Magnusson joined SCC from the law firm Mannheimer Schwartling in Stockholm and before that, Baker & McKenzie in Sweden. Ms. Annette Magnusson is the founder of the Stockholm Treaty Lab and International Crowdsourcing Challenge, 
to innovate international law for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And she is a frequent speaker on sustainability and arbitration, including addressing climate change and arbitration at the 24th ICA conference in Sydney, 2018. Ms. Magnusson is listed as a thought leader and global leader in who's who's legal. For today's purposes, most importantly, Ms. Magnusson is the author and editor of several publications on international arbitration, including Arbitrating for Peace by Kluwer 2017 and International Arbitration in uh, Sweden, Kluwer 2013. Ms. Magnusson is the producer of the documentary, The Quiet Triumph in 2017, which is a film about the interconnection between economic development, arbitration, and peace. So without further ado, I would like to warmly invite Ms. Magnusson to give us a few introductory words about the SEC. Ms. Magnusson, please. Thank you very much, Kirsten, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you also to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators for inviting me here today, and also, of course, to David and Brian for including me in today's event. It's really a pleasure to be here, and it's always very inspiring to have an opportunity to talk about uh, the underlying message uh, of the film that we will be doing here today. And certainly, I am a strong believer in international arbitration as a global force for good. So I'm looking forward to um, jumping into that discussion. Uh, just briefly then about the, the SSC here in Stockholm. So the SSC has been around for more than 100 years now, since 1917. And uh, we do on a yearly basis uh, today, about 200 some cases per year. Uh, we are mostly known, I think, from, uh, from the international standpoint, from doing East-West disputes. And that, of course, has its uh, clear background, which is described also in the film, how this came about. But we have a strong tradition of working with partners in China uh, and, and throughout the former Soviet Union. So that is sort of where the international practice from, from the SSC has emanated from. Although today we see parties from more than 40 different jurisdictions, usually on an annual basis. Um, and in addition to sort of the east-west profile of the SSC cases, we also see a lot of energy cases. And we also see a lot of investor state arbitrations here at the SSC. Uh, and this is because the SSC or Stockholm or Sweden has been included in more than 120 bilateral investment treaties for investor state dispute settlement procedures. Uh, so this is it's a sort of a wide specter of, of uh, different admi uh, administrative procedures we see here at the SSC. But a second, in addition to the operation, operations and operational parts here in, in Stockholm, uh, a second important issue for us, of course, is the policy to work on advocating arbitration as a means for resolving disputes. So this is something we also um, invest a lot of time in and to be part of that conversation. So I'm looking forward to doing that here at this webinar today. Thank you, Annette. Um, before we introduce our next distinguished speaker, I'm gonna just a little bit of housekeeping. There'll be some poll questions popping up during transitions while we introduce speakers. So please kindly take those, as many as you can, which will probably take like 15, 20 seconds each. You'll be playing a great part in the competitive studies on ADR development around the world. Okay. Um, so our next distinguished speaker is Dr. Hu Li, Vice Chairman of China Maritime Arbitration Commission. Prior to his current role, Dr. Li was the former Deputy Secretary General of CTAC, China's leading arbitral institution, and also a former uh, board member of the SEC, the leading Swedish arbitral institution. So with Annette, he's exactly the person we want to hear from about the Chinese and Swedish arbitration connection. Dr. Lee has served as an arbitrator for many years now. He is the exceed arbitrator designated by the Chinese government and also a panel member of numerous international and regional arbitral institutions in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and the US. We're very pleased to have you here today. Dr. Lee, would you like to briefly tell us about um, CMAC? Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David, for your kind introduction. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening from Beijing time. So I'm very happy to join the events. Uh, by the chance, I want to say some words about CMAC, China Maritime Arbitration Commission. The CMAC was founded in 1959, uh, just three years, three years after CTAC. 
and is the only one prominent maritime feature from related arbitration institution in China mainland. While dealing with all kinds of commercial cases, the CMAC specializes in maritime disputes and providing arbitration, mediation, and online arbitration services aiming to develop a maritime featured arbitration standard multi EDR mechanism. Last year, CMAC accepted 111 maritime arbitrations with 29 international ones. The percentage is 35 in which three cases probably have chosen English law, Canadian law, and Singapore law as applicable substantive law, respectively. Before 2017, the CMAC operated closely together with CTAC in terms of administrative and financial connections. The CMAC is always keeping the friendly relationship with other maritime and commercial arbitration institutions in the world. So I'm willing to stress in cooperation with all other international arbitration institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. It is great to hear about CMAC. Maritime arbitration is definitely an exceptional specialist area and we love to learn more about it in the years ahead. Um, so now it's a, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yang Fan. Dr. Yang Fan is the deputy director of the ADR department of CTAC. and is the Secretary General of the CTEC Online Dispute Resolution Center. Dr. Yang is also a CTEC arbitrator and mediator and a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Dr. Yang has over 17 years of experience in arbitration. She has arbitrated as sole arbitrator of various types of cases. She has administered as case manager nearly 200 international and domestic arbitration masses and has worked with arbitrators from different jurisdictions. Crucially, she has scrutinized over 100 jurisdictional rulings and over 1,500 arbitral awards. She was the chief editor of the periodical Arbitration at Law and is the drafter of the CTEC Construction Dispute Review Rules. Dr. Yang is qualified to practice law in PRC and New York. She received her LLB and LLM degrees from China Foreign Un Affairs University in 2000 and 2003, respectively and received an LLM degree from New York University School of Law in 2011. Um, and most recently, she received a law PhD degree from Tsinghua University Univers School of Law in 2020. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Yang. And I now warmly invite Dr. Yang to share a few words about CTEC. Dr. Yang, please. Okay, thank you, Kirsten, for a kind introduction. Um, thank you, ASEA, for organizing this event. I'm very honored to be in the panel for today's webinar with Dr. Lee and Annette, both very good old friends. And I would like to uh, briefly introduce CTEC to my dear friends online. Um, in, a, in a few words, CTEC with its full name, China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission, is also one of the world's major permanent international arbitration institution, institutions with a long history and it's the famous Chinese brand in international arbitration. Since its establishment in 1956, CTEC has accepted nearly 40,000 um, arbitration cases involving parties from more than 100 countries and regions and kept a very good record of awards enforcement domestically and internationally. CTEC's panel of arbitrators now lists 1,441 arbitrators, including 408 arbitrators um, from 65 countries or regions to better serve parties from different jurisdictions all over the world. In terms of institutional setup, CTEC is headquartered in Beijing and has built a nationwide network composed of a dozen domestic branches in different parts of China and as well as overseas branches at Hong Kong, Vienna, and Vancouver. CTEC is one of the busiest arbitration institutions in the world. Its caseload exceeded 1,000 cases per year since 2007 and further exceeded 2,000 cases per year since 2016 and crossed the threshold of 3,000 cases per year since 2019. In the year 2020, CTEC accepted 3,615 3, new cases with 739 foreign-related or international cases 
both reaching the record high in CPEX history. The total disputed amount was over 112 billion RMB, which is the third consecutive year that this figure exceeds 100 billion RMB. And the parties involved in these cases came from 76 countries or regions. So just by a glance, you see that even with the challenges of the pandemic, we are still as busy as be. <laughs> and these st statistics also can reflect the increasing contributions of CPEC as an important arbitration institution and the rising call for arbitration as a peaceful means of dispute resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. And so without further ado, we'll dive into the documentary, The Quiet Triumph, uh, that was created by the SEC. Um, and this is a rare opportunity to go behind the scenes. We have Ms. Annette Magnusson here with us today, and it's a rare opportunity to find out how it was to produce the documentary. So in this segment on behind the scenes, I, I, will have, uh, I would like to warmly invite uh, Ms. Magnusson to join me in this discussion. So uh, Ms. Magnusson, um, as the producer of this documentary, how would you describe the Quiet Tribe film in a nutshell? Thank you, Kristen. Um, well, in a nutshell, it's really about um, telling an untold story of success. It, um, like we say in the film, that the, the conflicts that never happened or that had a peaceful resolution, they rarely make the headlines. Uh, but the mechanisms that make this possible, that's really what the film is all about and the people involved in making it possible. Um, and to me and to us involved in making the film, we were driven by the sense that international arbitration really is a very uh, strong illustration of construct constructive collaboration between nations, even in against the background of, or backdrop of really strong political or cultural or, or economic differences. But here was a very strong sense of collaboration and cooperation dating, if you go back to centuries, but more recently in the last century, if you look at the 1958 New York Convention, if you look at the 1976 ancestral arbitration rules, so even the 1985 ancestral model law and commercial arbitration, these are hugely successful instru international instruments, even in spite of the fact that many of the countries that agree on these fundamental principles of neutral dispute resolution and fair proceedings were disagreeing on many other areas of, um, that they were collaborating in, but not here. And I think that really demonstrates the strength of international arbitration. So we wanted to sort of share these unknown stories and we wanted to inspire and we wanted to um, make everyone that saw the film feel like the, the bricks man building the cathedral, right? So you know the story of the bricks man. So you could either have the view that you are laying bricks and that's what you're doing, or you can have the view that you're building a cathedral. And we wanted everyone that saw the film involved in international arbitration to really leave the movie theater with a sense of, yes, we are building a cathedral. That was sort of the thinking behind the film. Wonderful, thank you, Annette. And uh, what was the inspiration of the planning process towards creating this documentary? It was, surely it's a huge endeavor. And so it probably took some time to uh, plan and you know, produce this. So what was that experience like? Many things obviously that inspired us, but I think what started the process uh, was two main things. And it was that um, meeting individuals uh, in different, um, opportunities for me to meet individuals that had played a role at the outset of the international development here in Stockholm. So, and some of them you meet also in the film. So that sort of, that very informal um, encounters, if you want to call it that, that and, and the, the, the stories that were shared at those encounters led me to think that we need to really capture these stories because they are unique. So that was one inspiration. And in parallel to that, uh, when we started planning the film, this is around 2014, um, there was a strong critique against international arbitration um, here in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, uh, in North America, not the least. Um, and I felt that that critique was deeply unfair and deeply unbalanced. And I wanted to really demonstrate the, the true value of international arbitration. So we do not um, wreck this fantastic cathedral that has been built over the centuries. So these were the two main drivers, I would say, were inspirations for us as we planned the film. 
Thank you, uh, Annette. I, I think um, there was a lot of discussion on uh, winter is coming for arbitration. And today exactly. it's like spring is coming <laughs> for arbitration. <laughs> so the transition over time, uh, I'm sure the Quiet Triumph indeed had an invaluable part in that process. Um, and so with your experience in producing this film, uh, what was your favorite part about it in producing this? Um, I think there are many parts that are, are, are truly unique and that really stand out. Um, and uh, um, and it's, it's, always, it's always difficult to know when you plan the film and when you make all the interviews and you talk about it, what, will, what it, it in the end will uh, turn out to be. And of course, here we had a fantastic director, Martin Boris, that really contributed to sort of putting the film together. Um, but I do think that um, Dr. Tang Wu Tsi uh, is really one of the stars of the film. I think the way he carries himself and the way he just speaks to you on the screen is one of the, some of the strongest moments to me in the film. Um, and, and I can tell also from having been present at many of the screenings of the film in various parts of the world that when, um, when he looks straight into the camera and he, and he talks about how we should work more together and collaborate, I think that's that's really a strong moment in the film that really uh, captures the audience. Indeed, it really was endearing and resonated with us. And uh, we will be happy to share sn snippets of that uh, with the audience in a bit. Uh, but before we go into that, um, perhaps Annette, if you could share with us, uh, how was the decision process in selecting the peasants to be interviewed uh, to feature in the film? It was a brainstorming exercise to begin with. So Ulf Franke, who was the secretary general before me, he had this job for 35 years, obviously. So he, he knew many of these people first time. He had worked with them and, and we have always worked very well together, Ulf and I. So we actually sat down and just brainstormed, you know, who are the, who, who should we talk to? Who are the people that are crucial? And, and many times for, for having had one conversation with a person, uh, we would have ideas from whom else we should be talking to. Uh, so they were sort of added as the story grew on us and, and we were given more details. Um, so it was not a set list of participants from the very beginning. It sort of evolved over the three years as we were working on the film. Um, and Nina Lagergren, who's really a central figure in the film, her contribution or her appearance on the film was decided fairly late. And that was the result of me hearing her speak on the radio. Um, we have a, an annual uh, series of radio programs here in Sweden in the summer where public figures uh, is given an hour and a half to talk about their life and their experiences in, in very different walks of life. And so Nina Lagergren one summer was one of them. And she, she talked about her and Gunnar Lagergren's life together which was really a capturing story. And she talked about how uh, her husband Gunnar came to choose the career of this uh, peaceful resolution of disputes. So after that radio show, I was just so taken away by her. So I actually sent her a letter and told her, maybe making this film, would she like to share her story with us? And that's how she came to be such an important part of the film. That's wonderful. And today we also uh, remember her and uh, commemorate her life and that of Mr. Gunnar Lagergren. Um, we will give tributes to her as part of this series and we are grateful for that insight. I cannot imagine the Quiet Triumph film without Nina. I feel like she's <laughs> such an essential part as, as like Professor Tang. And so we remember both of them in memoriam and we thank them mm -hmm. for the legacy. Um, so Annette, um, are there any updates? I know that this film was launched uh, at the NCC Centennial 2017. So has there been any feedback or updates uh, post launch of the film? Yes, the feedback has been fantastic. And I, I, I can be honest and say that when we were making the film, my calendar sort of stopped <laughs> At the, at, the, at the premiere date, right? So in my mind, there was nothing after that because I was so focused on this date in January in 2017. So it was like, after that, it was completely white in my calendar. <laughs> I had not been thinking at all. And what happened was actually quite extraordinary. So we, we were invited, including by SeaTac in both in Shanghai and Beijing to, to do screenings of the film, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and we, we have been in so many different places in the world and show the film. In addition to the fact that it's been uh, viewed more than 10,000 times online uh, through where we have posted it. So that's truly, truly amazing. Um, and we also know that it's being used in teaching by uh, all over, uh, over the world, the different universities uh, teaching at public international law uh, or social sciences for that matter, international relations. So it's really used in a wide variety of contexts, which is really 
what we had hoped for in, in terms of sending a strong message. Uh, so we still to this day receive um, messages from people who have seen it and are inspired by it. And um, we hope that this will continue. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, we do hope to still continue uh, seeing the film. I know it was, uh, it was a road show in Asia that uh, brought the film to Asia and uh, we really look forward to seeing more updates about it. Um, and at this juncture, I understand that Dr. Lee, who um, also served as an SEC board member. So I'd like to invite Dr. Lee to give his views on why uh, you think international arbitration plays such an important and effective uh, method of amicable dispute settlement. Uh, Dr. Lee, please. Thank you, Annette. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. So in my mind, the first is that compared with court litigation, arbitration, is approach of EDR and not so much adversarial. It's arbitrating for peace, as showed by the film. The second, it is a game with the legal and other industry experts as the main players. The lastly, the award can be recognized in first universally with many thanks to the New York Convention of 1958. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Yang, um, I'd like to ask, uh, what are your views on the Quiet Triumph fil film um, from the CTAC perspective? Dr. Yang, please. Uh, Dr. Yang, you're on mute. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this um, sentimental documentary of SCC is is, is really a very impressive film, uh, telling the stories of the quiet heroes in the field of international arbitration, such as Judge Gunnar Lagergren from Sweden, uh, Judge Howard Holtzman from USA, Professor Sergei Lobedev from Russia, and Professor Tan Hojo from China. I really like um, Annette's interviews, the way um, she took us with her to walk into the history and to hear the true stories from these witty old heroes who themselves are part of the history. <laughs> um, and now arbitration we know is very popular as a means of dispute resolution for commercial disputes and more and more popular for resolving investment disputes. But we may not know why arbitration was invented in the first place. So the, this film provides us with a historical angle on how arbitration was born to facilitate peaceful resolution of disputes between nations during trade so as to avoid war or force. So arbitration was born for peace and peaceful dispute resolution. That was its mission and charm. It's also the faith and goal of arbitrators and arbitration institutions to solve disputes peacefully and boost trade and prosperity for the better future of human beings. So one word to recommend the film, if we don't know where arbitration is from, we will not know where it's going. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. Indeed, wise words. Um, and circling back to Annette, um, for those who are you know, in the audience who have not seen the film at this uh, juncture, what are three key takeaways you would say uh, we would you know, go away from this film um, and with regard to the life stories that are shared of the quiet heroes? Annette, please. Thank you. Well, you have heard us, all three of us now, talk about sort of the underlying message of the, uh, the strong force of international arbitration as a tool for peace and peaceful relations between nations. And I think also adding to that sort of how that the importance of international arbitration for economic development and the fact that having a strong economic development also contributes to peaceful relations between nations. So I do think that this is an underlying message that we wanted to convey with the film. Personally, there I think there are three takeaways that I that stay with me when I talk about the film, and in addition to the sort of the overarching message that I've been talking about. And first is that one thing that really impressed me uh, as I had the privilege of making these interviews is that really the integrity um, and the professionalism of all the people that I met, and really the deep founded respect that they felt for each other regardless of whether they were sitting in Beijing and talking about a colleague in New York or sitting in Moscow and talking about something someone in Beijing, right? So th these were people that have a true strong respect for each other and the principles which they applied in their daily practice. 
Um, and I do think the fact that it tells us that in the end, people are people, right? So we just to, to give us all an opportunity to meet and to discuss the joint issues and to share our stories, people will be people. And that's really what stays with you, the integrity uh, of these meetings uh, and the deep found respect that they had for each other. Um, so that, that would be my first takeaway. And, and, and second, the, the film that, or the story that you see in the film is really not the full story. And by, by that, I mean that so many times when we have been screening the film, and I would say particularly in China, but also in other places, after the end of the film, people would come up to me and they would share their own personal stories of the sort of of the events that are being portrayed in the film or the people that are being portrayed, portrayed in the film. So someone came up to me and shared the first time she had the privilege to meet uh, Dr. Tang Hozi and that meeting and, and really, really personal stories. So I think that really sort of expanded the story for me uh, as we were as we were screening the film. So that's that's the second takeaway. This is not the full story. There are more films to be made out there. So maybe this could be an inspiration for anyone watching this if you want to do the sequel. Um, there's plenty of material still to work from. And my third takeaway is really um, the inspiration that was given from a screening we did in, in uh, El Salvador. But I think it's valid for, for anyone watching the film. But it's really the fact that anyone can be a quiet hero. So use it as an inspiration to, to make your contribution, to make your piece of the world a better and more peaceful place. Thank you so much, Annette, uh, for that inspiring clarion call. Indeed, I think we cannot wait to hear about the other stories. And, and I think it's on us as well to continue the legacy that these quiet heroes have, you know, have started for us as a foundation. And I think it's a perfect time, I think, to um, uh, provide tributes to uh, our unsung heroes, especially Professor Tang Ho Zi and um, Mr. and Mrs. Gunnar and Nina Lagergren. So at this point, it will be a privilege, and I thank the SEC for giving us the permission to do uh, this. We would be happy to share a trailer of the documentary. And so we welcome everyone to um, enjoy. This is one truly remarkable woman. For many of us, Nina Lagergren is famous for her endless struggle for her lost brother, Ralph Wallenberg. What might be less known is that her husband, Gunnar Lagergren, was one of the great peacemakers of the 20th century. In Nina's attic outside Stockholm rests a hidden treasure. It's a treasure of hope, values, reason. This is the story of quiet heroes and how their legacy is all around us every day. Let me show you. Thank you. 
Every nation, every country has to trade with others just to gain the benefits of comparative advantage. Every businessman I know wants to do business. He does not want to have disputes. Oh, it's been astounding. They need to know if there are disputes, what are their remedies and how to resolve it. Arbitration is the grease that helps the economies flow and, and brings those benefits uh, around the world. You know what happened? Of course, for me, it is an important factor in my life. Well, it's uh, indeed a great honor. And it was very nice to, to see the three gentlemen in front of His Majesty the King here in Stockholm. Lebedev, Holtzman and Tang have been very important for building the international arbitral community. I see a message from Ulf Framke. One is appointed to this as not only uh, handed over. You have been proposed to be awarded by a polar star. They given by the king the order of polar star. The king will be prepared to meet you on such and such date in Stockholm. If you agree, we met the king and there were photographs and we shake, shake the hands with him and then he gave us to each of us, he gave the order. It was something very special, of course. Indeed, a great honor of Mr. Tang. Not only of Mr. Tang, of China. It's a great honor. Of course, and the question is, and why? What is the reason why the king, the Swedish king, decided to make such an award? And I say the reason is that we helped to develop arbitration in general and also for Sweden within our possibilities. Okay, that is the reason. And for me, of course, this award is of very particular importance and honor. It's, it's, it's somewhat of a, of a gift to the, uh, to, to, to the whole industry, the arbitration industry. Krig måste undvikas och man måste se till att minimera faserna i världen. Det är för lätt att sätta igång krig. Vi skulle vara glada om vi kan göra något mer. Keep going on the way now and learn more from each other. I'm telling you, uh, <laughs> if, if, if I am provoked, I, I can talk for a long time. <laughs>
Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed uh, the trailer uh, and snippets of the documentary, The Quiet Triumph. Um, it is now my pleasure to invite Ms. Magnuson to say a few words about Ms. Nina Lagergren. Uh, Ms. Magnuson, please. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, and uh, to begin, just to say that Nina Lagergren was a, a very unique uh, person. Um, she spent a very long life uh, she's well known for her pursuit of the truth about her brother, Val Wallenberg, um, uh, another Swedish hero during World War II. Uh, but she also lived very much in his spirit to make a difference and to inspire others uh, to do the same. And together with her husband, Gunnar Lagergren, she saw the horrors of war firsthand. Um, but she also saw how peaceful resolution of disputes can be achieved uh, also in very, very dire circumstances. The experiences from Berlin uh, during World War II led Gunnar to devote his career to peace and resolution of disputes and Nina followed him along the way. And Nina never seemed to lose hope in the potential of kindness and thoughtful optimism. Um, and she certainly practiced that herself. And when we began producing the film and recording the interviews. She was well into her 90s, uh, but she was an energizing star in front of the camera, as you well can see, uh, and really re recollecting her, her memories that, that made a difference. Um, and um, we interviewed her two years before the actual premiere of the film. And like I said, she was well into her 90s. Um, and when she asked when the film would have its premiere and we said it would be in January of 2017, she just, you know, gave that little smile and she said, well, I just have to make sure to stay alive until then. <laughs> and this, of course, you did. And well, after that, um, and she was really a star at the, at the premiere uh, uh, her, at itself. Uh, and one thing that... Um, was really something that struck with me uh, as we were doing the interviews with her is that um, she was very generous in, in inviting us to her home and to share in her memories with us and really very really proud of the fact that her, what her husband Gunnar had achieved. So she was very happy to be able to share that story with us since Gunnar was no longer with us at the time we were doing the interviews. Um, and this warm atmosphere, I think that she set for our meetings is also something that is very visible in the interviews of the film. Um, and towards the end of the film, as you saw here in the clip, when she says, she really contemplates and she says it's too easy to start wars. And I think that's really another strong moment in the film. She kind of uh, traces off in her own thoughts, but you can tell there's a lot of things coming to her mind when she says these words. And I think that's really a strong moment that stays with you. Um, and like I said, when we had the pr premiere of the film in 2017, she was really radiant and she was really a star of the red carpet and surrounded by her, her family, uh, her children, her grandchildren. Um, and many people really expressed um, after the premiere that they were absolutely um, in awe of being even in the same room as Nina Lagergren. So she had this really strong charisma and star quality and really a role model for anyone wanting to devote their life and working towards in smaller or larger environments, but really to do the good thing uh, and making a difference for societies to be, to be better and for people to be better persons. She was really a true inspiration for that. And she really practiced it herself on a daily basis. Thank you so much, Annette. I think we're truly inspired by Nina and we'll always remember her fondly and may her legacy leave on. Um, and we celebrate her life and that of uh, Mr. Gunnar Lagergren as well as Professor Tang. So it would be a great um, opportune time to invite Dr. Lee to say a few words uh, in tribute in, mem in memory of Dr. Uh, Professor Tang. Dr. Lee, please. Okay. I met Professor Tang once again in the film just now. So before Professor Tang passed away in March of last year, I visited Professor Tang three times on behalf of CMAG and CTAC. Every time Professor Tang encouraged me to keep going on the way, encouraged me to do my best to promote arbitration and mediation, encouraged me to promote CTAC and CMAG to strengthen cooperation 
with other international opportunity centers, especially with Stockholm, our friends. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Indeed, really inspiring. And it's so fortunate that you had that interaction with Professor Tang. Um, experiences that you know we do cherish. And uh, I would now like to warmly invite Dr. Yang to also share a few words about Professor Tang. Uh, Dr. Yang, please. Pay hey, tribute to Professor Tang because today is the anniversary of the date he passed away. Um, we, we love him dearly and we miss him wholeheartedly. We are still blessed with his rich spiritual legacy today. Professor Tang is a respectable pioneer in Chinese arbitration and has devoted all his life to arbitration and arbitrating for peace. He was, he was the China face in international arbitration community and has made tremendous contributions in building a bridge between Chinese arbitration and international arbitration and promoted the CETA initiated oriental experience of co combining arbitration with conciliation internationally. Uh, we have, I have tons of stories of Professor Tang to share, but I may not have the time today. But um, he, what I want to say is he was truly a hero for our young generation of arbitration professionals. And we will carry on his unfinished work and will and try to accomplish our mission, the mission of our time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. Indeed, um, it's now a great uh, privilege to introduce David, uh, my co-host for today, as he takes us through the analysis into the special uh, SEC and CTEC relationship. Um, David, please. Awesome, thank you, Kirsten. Um, and thank you everyone for your tributes to the quiet heroes. As Kirsten mentioned, I believe that we all hope um, we not only remember them and thank them, but also do our part in inheriting their legacy and passing them down to our next generation. And before that, I'm gonna do another poll. Sorry to interrupt you all. Okay. Um, yeah, well, just one more thing. I, I have to admit, every time I watch this video, I'm touched. And I don't think it's just because I'm an arbitration enthusiast, nor because of the grand music. I don't think so. There's something more. I believe um, we all have this desire deep inside us, longing for peace and kind of a hunger for these kinds of inspirational stories which makes me really curious about the unique relationship between China and Sweden tied by arbitration as a medium. To be honest, um, I didn't know much until Kirsten passionately introduced to me about this. So for those who are in the same shoes as me, the second round of our discussion will be a great opportunity. Maybe we can start with a little bit of history. Um, Dr. Lee. I heard that there were several major events in the 80s and 90s that contributed to this special bond. What happened back then? And how is arbitration related? Could you tell us about it? Okay, okay, David. Uh, as introduced by Annette, uh, in field dispute resolution, the Stockholm of Sweden is a neutral place for arbitrating international commercial disputes. Traditionally, you know, the Chinese party used to choose arbitration in Stockholm. If I remember rightly, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, SCC accepted about eight arbitrations in connection with Chinese parties annually. In the meantime, the bilateral arbitration collaboration is always playing a personal role to this special bond. In the early 1990s, the SCC and CTAC, including CMAC, started to do business with each other and build the work relationship. In practice, we have created a usual way to visit and jointly hold conferences, seminars, and workshops to promote arbitration and ideas together. And that, Dr. Patricia Shaughnessy, the former LCC vice president, Mr. Johan Ganes, the former LCC president, and 
Mr. Wu for Frankie, the former LCC Secretary General, visited China many times. Every time in the co-organized events, Mr. Frankie began his speech with, how are you in Chinese? Ni hao. So Ms. Frankie, <laughs> you have gained that proficiency also set at CTEC tribunals as arbitrators and the bureaucrats with Chinese arbitration. Professor Tang Hou Zhi has made great contribution to our bilateral cooperation and was awarded the Polar Star Commander Prize by Swedish Ukraine. What impressed me that Professor Tang insisted every time to pick up and meet our Swedish friends in person at the airport. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yu Jianlong, the former CTEC CMAC Secretary General, promoted actively our good relationship. Now both sides jointly coordinated, coordinated the interrelations in such, such organizations as ICA and IFCA. I, by myself, you know, served as SEC board member for six years from 2015 to 2020. And I do my best to address in this special bond. I'm going to do so in my capacity of vice chairman of CMAC. So other, on the other hand, some Chinese arbitrators and lawyers were appointed in LCC arbitrations as arbitrators for the legal councils. Relatively speaking, the Chinese arbitration community knows well about LCC arbitration. Another point, the last way is that academic change between the two countries in terms of arbitration. At least eight CTEC and CMEC members, though, including myself, pursued their legal studies in Swedish universities. I was two times invited to give lecture to Stockholm University students of master program international promotion arbitration. Annette and Patricia were also invited to give a lecture at the Chinese universities, including China University of Political Science and Law, Tsinghua University, and the University of International Business and Economics. All of this established a, the special relationship between our two institutions. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, that was very interesting. So, um, so it's beyond strategical or business relationship. I, that just reminded me one of the not many words that I know in Chinese, guan si. I think it's all about friendship and relationship. So it's, it's like, it's a different story. It definitely gives me a better understanding. Thank you about uh, the background and listening to that, Annette, I believe you have something to share with us too. What's, what's your view and perhaps your experience regarding this relationship? How important is China and also CTAC for SEC? Thank you, David. Well, first, I can only concur with Dr. Li, who uh, has just been sharing on the importance of these frequent exchange of delegations and individuals and in, in, in different contexts. Um, and I think, Dr. Lee, uh, you and I met the first time in 1999, right, in Stockholm, when you were at Stockholm University. Uh, and from this first encounter, I happen to know that Dr. Lee is a great chef. He's really good at making Chinese food. So I will just leave you with that. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Annette. <laughs> My thesis is about the enforcement of international commercial option work, which has been proofread by Annette. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. So we go way back. But also, when I started as a Secretary General in 2010, uh, I had been one day uh, on the job, and then day two, uh, Ulf Franke, who was there to sort of guide me into this new role, Ulf and I went to China. So that was sort of, you can tell from, from uh, the priorities there that this is this is important. You know, you, you, you arrive as Secretary General, and day two, you travel to China, because to meet uh, everyone there and to sort of do the rounds in terms of um, all the different seminars and uh, meeting the different people was really important. So um, I, I have spent 10 days then uh, for my first trip to China in this capacity uh, to Beijing and to Shanghai and met with CETA colleagues and, and other practitioners in the two cities, which is really sort of uh, the starting point for my, my time here as a Secretary General. And of course, since then, 
um, it has continued as, as as Dr. Lee described in terms of exchanges of, or different experiences. And we also had the privilege to have a number of interns here at the SSE, for example, from CTEC, from Secret Secretariat. Um, this is a practice we have done with, um, over the years, which is really valuable to, to, uh, to share the experiences and to learn from one another and to joint sort of practice building, if you like, to have the joint international best practice in terms of uh, administration arbitration cases when we exchange experience, really first-hand experience. And, and that was really a really great opportunity also for us to learn how things are being done at the CTEC uh, administration of cases. So really to see, to compare and see how we can improve and, and so forth and learn from each other. So this has been really, really, really valuable. Um, and, and I cannot underscore how much it is, how much it matters to have these personal relations. Uh, um, like I said, people are people and uh, uh, it's when we meet and when we compare notes and we talk about uh, um, all the things that are involved, not only with arbitration, but actually being an international professional, that's really when we build things together. So it's been a, it's been a true privilege, for sure. Thank you, Annette. I, I love the um, quote, people are people. <laughs> and what do you say friendship in uh, Swedish? Ben Scott. Okay, I'm gonna try. <laughs> so it's about Quancy and Van Skull. Exactly. <laughs> okay. It's amazing that one of the very first thing you did as Secretary General was to pack and go to China. Exactly. I think that itself tells you a lot. <laughs> and um, Fan, if I may, Dr. Yang, <laughs> back to you. Hey, Fan. <laughs> Okay. You're currently serving as uh, the deputy, uh, deputy director of CTAC ADR department. And I heard CTAC and SEC, as Annette um, shared with us, are still actively cooperating with each other. Can you tell us about this ongoing collaboration between the two leading arbitral institutions? Are there any like recent projects you can share with us? Okay, thank you. I think uh, Dr. Lee and Annette has, has already uh, briefed the audience about the long history of cooperation between the two institutions. Yes, based on the very good people to people relationship, build a very good uh, institutional relationship. So uh, I may highlight um, some updates on the cooperation between the two institutions. Um, in, in the recent three years, I'll just call it, in 2019, CTEC co-hosted the Belt and Road um, Arbitration Institutions Roundtable Forum uh, with important international arbitration institu institutions, including SCC, during the uh, China Arbitration Week and announced the Beijing Joint Declaration of the Belt and Road Arbitration Institutions, um, agreed by over 40 Chinese, uh, arbitration for, for 40 Chinese and foreign arbitration institutions. Um, the participating dispute resolution institutions are determined to join efforts to promote cooperation, um, enhance dialogue and develop the Belt and Road arbitration mechanism. In 2020, in face of the threat and challenges posed by the COVID-19, we stood together and fought together. Um, CTEC provided anti-pandemic supplies to uh, 34 dispute resolution institutions, including SCC, and joined upon invitation the joint statement um, on arbitration and COVID-19 initiated by 13 major international in arbitration institutions, including SCC, to facilitate a fair and efficient international dispute resolution. And this year, apart from today's webinar, which is another collaboration between, uh, among our, our institutions, I would happily forecast another important event, the CAI and International Investment Arbitration Summit um, will be co-hosted by SCC and CTEC with other international arbitration institutions on the 26th of this month. So March the 26th, save the day. So investment arbitration, in addition to commercial arbitration is our new field of cooperation. So in one word, the two institutions have long friendship in the past, and have promising cooperation in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Fan. Um, March 26th, you guys all heard that, right? <laughs> so it sounds like you definitely have a lot going there. And um, again, what an interesting relationship. While listening, mm, 
I felt like um, this collaboration between SeaTac and SEC, the the harmony and the chord between the two, could be could be something that we really need, especially in the time like these days. Can I share and, a picture? Sure, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> we wait, we wait. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, here you go. <laughs> This is me picking up the package from Beijing on masks. Uh, oh, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So there you go. There you have collaboration in practice. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you for that. And well, thank that you for the package. <laughs> <laughs> um, that being said, I think it's a great point to turn to our last topic the way forward. Um, Kirsten, would you like to take over? Uh, thank you so much, David. I think I'm going to follow on from the discussion that was just shared. Um, I think one key question I may ask uh, the panel is this, uh, in view of, you know, speaking about mask and COVID-19 years, um, why do you think arbitration is still relevant today? And what can we do to continue the legacies of the quiet heroes today? I would uh, welcome uh, Ms. Magnuson, your views on this question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I do think that uh, one thing that we all can do is not to lose sight of the bigger picture. And I, I, I fully understand that when you are sitting in your, with your brief at 2 a.m. in the morning and you know, your client is breathing down your neck, you don't feel like you're building a cathedral for sure. Uh, but, uh, and, and so, you know, we have to sort of go uh, to the details, but also not forget about the bigger picture. And I, so I think that's something we all can do, uh, regardless of the role that we have in international dispute resolution to whenever we have that opportunity to, um, to, to apply that bigger picture uh, to do that. Uh, but also as we, as we um, even argue our cases, right? So we are, we are part of a bigger multilateral universe and I, and I think it matters. And I do think that the world need that at this, uh, needs that at this point. Thank you very much. We cannot lose sight of the bigger picture. Thank you very much. It's definitely something to bear in mind. And Dr. Lee, if I may invite you to share a few words about the same question. Uh, why does arbitration still matter today, especially in the COVID years? Yes, undoubtedly, the last unexpected COVID-19 pandemic has caused more disputes. For disputes resolution, arbitration still matters. In the essence, you know, Mediation results in a settlement agreement. Settlement agreement is a compromise between both parties compared with arbitration. The mediation procedure is more flexible. So arbitration should be conducted strictly or go into the applicable law, applicable arbitration rules and special agreements of parties and end with a final award of the arbitrator. So the arbitrator should decide the case in accordance with the applicable substantive law. The role of the arbitrator's award cannot be replaced by the party's settlement agreement. So the arbitrator cannot be overridden by the mediation. The arbitration has its own special value in the dispute resolution. Arbitration still matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. And Dr. Yang, uh, what are your thoughts on these questions uh, as we look ahead to the future? Well, um... I think the pandemic has caused a lot of instabilities and uncertainties in the world and arbitration as a peaceful means of dispute resolution is an indispensable force in increasing the stability in the development of economic globalization and also in the world's fight against the pandemic. Um, can you imagine what it will be or how business people or investors will resolve their disputes in the world without arbitration? <laughs> So, but one benefit I think from the arbitration institution's response to COVID-19 uh, challenges is the rapid development of the online dispute resolution. So I think um, CTEC and also I think SCC and other major international arbitration institutions has developed their online um, dispute resolution systems. And I think this is the way into the future. It may, um, it may 
It may get the international arbitration to be a more convenient, more accessible, more cost-effective um, peaceful dispute resolution mechanism for everyone in need. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Um, I'm confident to hear about the measures you know, that uh, the institutions have put in place for a more robust arbitration uh, mechanism in this digitalized world. And I think we have to take heart that the future will be brighter uh, from here on. And let's not lose hope and uh, not forget the legacies that of the quiet unsung heroes. I hope this is not the end of the conversation. I hope it will continue. There's so much to look forward to. Um, we may not have the time to share about the climate change project that the SEC has under Ms. Magnuson, but let's stay tuned, let's stay in touch and collaborate in future projects uh, to make this world a peaceful and better place for all. And uh, on that note, I want to thank all of the hosts, uh, global sponsors, collaborating institutions, the SEC, CMAC, CTEC, and of course to our esteemed panel speakers, uh, Ms. Annette Magnuson, Dr. Li Hu, Dr. Yang Sun, and of course, uh, to the central organizing group led by Brian Brennan and uh, David, who is my co-host today, and importantly to Tiawen as well uh, for you know helping us with the, the the chat box discussion. Thank you so much, and to all of the attendees, thank you for tuning in. We hope to keep in touch, and uh, we'll share the recording when when it's available. I'd like to encourage you to also take a look at the SEC Quiet uh, uh, Quiet Triumph documentary that's available online. And so please check out the websites for further information and we hope to see you soon again.